Hello, everyone. My name is Mike Lowe, and I'm in the office of the CTO at Tetra Science as a solution architect. And I beat the often path by working for a completely innovative company called Tetra Science, where you have a unique mission. And that mission is to combine deep domain knowledge with the industry's only purpose-built scientific data cloud and the largest network of life science innovators to harness the power of the world's scientific data. And we have also a fairly unique goal, which is really the rapid assembly of the world's scientific data post-haste. Today's episode feels like pure science fiction. What is a digital twin? How could this help us to make better and faster pharmaceuticals? And why is that important? And why am I already so confused? I don't know what I'm talking about. We know that there's so much data about us and our bodies and soon our brains out there. Is there a reality in which we can use that data to remove human testing from the process of finding new treatments? How can we use machine learning and artificial intelligence to better understand the data that we have? If this feels like something with massive, profound implications for our future, future and our health, you're probably right. And I'll be honest, I barely understand what any of this means. That's why we're lucky that joining me right now is Mike Lose, the Vice President of Solution Architecture at Tetra Science, a tech bio company with over 100 leading pharmaceutical and biotech companies as customers. So here's Mike Lose, I'm Ross Palmer, and this is Beat the Often Path. Uh, all right, so welcome to the show, Mike. Uh, Los, is that of Dutch descent then? You are of Dutch descent, it, it perhaps? It is actually of German descent. Uh, uh, interestingly okay. enough, comes as a derivative of Nikolaus. And so another interesting thing about me, there is um, uh, evidence that one of my ancestors is actually the original St. Nicholas. <laughs> Get out. Okay. <laughs> That is almost too wild to believe. Uh, there, all right, so there's a few places to jump into this. Um, it's a very technical field, but I'm not even going to talk about any of that because we're going to talk about golf. This is now a golf podcast because I have heard that you have once shot par on nine holes and it is your lifelong dream to shoot par on 18. Is that correct? It is very true. Yeah, I, um, the unfortunate piece was I was by myself when I shot that par on the nine holes. So it's tough. You know, like they always say, even people that get hole in ones, it doesn't count if somebody wasn't there to see it. That's so true. nobody was actually there to see it. But I did shoot a 36 with one bogey and one birdie on nine holes. So, yeah, but it is my lifelong goal to do that on all set. I'll thir- uh, sorry, all 18 and maybe round it about for a full weekend. That'd be great. That would be amazing. I'm in the same camp. I have shot 75 as my all-time record up until now, and I have I have had a witnessed par through nine on the back nine, and that was a round I shot 75 in, but it's elusive. I'm really not in any striking distance of, of shooting even par through 18. Yeah, you know I, how I, hard I, I, it I is. Can't yeah. keep it together for 18 full holes. Yeah. So I completely understand, right? I either can't start well enough or I can't finish well enough, but uh, it's somewhere along the way there's going to be some kind of mistake. So that's it. This is going to be a golf podcast from now on. Forget business. Forget Perfect. science. Get all forget all of that. <laughs> it's going to be called Fairways, Greens, and Successful IPOs, Three Things That Nobody Ever Achieves. I'll, I'll gladly go host with you. Sounds like a okay. great Okay. All right. Great. I think people would be more interested in that. Um, all right. But what, what you have is a very highly technical thing. And part of the interest, I mean, this connection comes by way of somebody who is in the biotech space that I greatly respect. Um, and I will freely admit that I am very ignorant of a lot of the implications of what your company is and what it does because it's a very highly technical thing. That said, the value is obvious. The amount of funding that the company has received is insane. The amount of partners that the company has is also insane. So clearly, you're part of something that has tapped into something very incredible. So help dumb it down for idiots like me as to what is the significance of all of this. Sure. No, great question. Great question. So if you think about the the biopharma industry, right, what is what is their goal? But the primary mission of it is really to improve and extend human life. If you were to ask everybody and dumb down all of their mission statements, that's really what they're trying to accomplish. However, it's extremely difficult today for a lot of these large biopharma companies to be able to get their data centralized so that they can make smarter decisions. In fact, it's a it's a big push to try to do things with what they call digital twins, where I take the data from you know where it is today, I put it somewhere digitally so that I can potentially run many of my experiments in silico and not even have to physically go and run the experiments in the lab. But the issue with that is how do I get all that data into that one place 
so that I can effectively do that because the data is everywhere. When I say this, there are literally hundreds of thousands of data sources within large biopharmas. This includes things like traditional databases. It includes files that live on file shares. It includes USB sticks. That's not a joke. We like to call that sneaker net where they plug a USB stick and they walk around with their sneakers to another machine and they plug it in over there. Okay. So it's extremely difficult for our customers to be able to do that on their own. And so they contract with a company like us who has a purpose-built scientific data cloud where we help them assemble that data into a cloud-based solution. And then we harmonize it. We call it engineering that data so that it now becomes fully queryable for you to be able to do those new and innovative things. So it takes 10 to 15 years roughly for customers now to be able to bring a drug to market. What if we dropped one year? What if we got two, three, four? What does that mean for human life? And so it really excites me because what we really can do is help our customers bring their drugs and their therapies to market faster than they ever could before to really improve human life. Okay, and this company is relatively new, right? So, well, I guess, okay, 2014, it started and then switched relatively quickly. 2019 switched somehow, right? What, what yeah, was that yeah. Change? So, so we, we, we call it Tetra 1.0 and Tetra 2.0, if you will, okay. right? So the Tetra yeah. 1.0 was really focused on trying to help customers within what we thought was a pretty large problem space, and it still is, don't get me wrong. It's just not as big as where we are now, which was there's a lot of instruments in these labs that – don't have really strong technical interfaces to get the data out of them. So great example are just environmental monitoring systems. So it really does matter when you're dealing with a sample. And that's uh, so uh, COVID is a great example of this, right? You had to actually take a lot of those um, injection drugs and store them in a deep freezer. So because if they weren't, they would spoil, right? Uh, fundamentally, they spoil. And so environmental systems matter, temperature, um, uh, oxygen ratio, nitrogen ratio in the air, all of that matters as, as far as keeping the sample in a safe, secure uh, you know, environment. And so you need to monitor those systems and try to marry that data with the results, right? And so originally, Tetra 1.0, was was a IoT hardware kind of vendor where we would supply hardware to those customers to plug into those devices to try to network enable them so that it could send that data to the cloud. But it was really focused on that sort of environmental monitoring and simple device like uh, ovens, right? <laughs> I mean, ovens and freezers, these things matter, but really all they can give you is a temperature at a given time. And so we were focused on that to start with, but as we evolved and started working with, with a lot of these customers, we found that there was a bigger problem statement in just assembling the result data from all their experiments so that they can make these types of decisions in a much more rapid manner and potentially create these digital twins to be able to do AI ML type solutions. So that's that's so we that Tetra 2.0 was that switch where we said, you know what, the hardware business for this IoT stuff, it matters, but there's many players in that space. Nobody right now is trying to help their customers build a product and solution, especially in the cloud space to centralize all of that experimental results to make those better decisions. Mm. So three things that people associate with money and things they don't understand, machine learning, uh, data, and pharma, right? Those are Thank three things that the average person knows are very, very important to our modern world. And yet also, and again, people like me don't really have a clue about how these things work. So let's talk a little bit about this concept of the digital twin. Let's talk a bit about the opportunity here. And then let's also, I want to get a bit into your personal story as we go on and how you ended up in this mission sure. as well. But uh, yeah, what is the significance of this and why should people learn about these types of con uh, these types of concepts, especially people who might not be familiar with any of those three things? Yeah. So, so you're going to, you're going to hear a lot of, well, you do, you hear a lot of buzz and a lot of social media rants around cost of drugs. Right. And, and people like it should just be free. You know, at, at, first of all, fundamentally, from a human being perspective, I understand that argument. But what okay. people don't recognize is that three point two, I think, trillion dollars a year are spent by pharma with an attempt to find the next drug or therapy to help you. That all it has cost. That's not coming from public funding. That's coming from private companies working together yeah. to try to solve for this. They've got to be able to monetize that. And it's not necessarily yeah. about making money. It's about recouping the cost so we can actually extend or extend and deliver on our mission and then be able to fund the next yeah. one, which is going to, again, extend and make available the mission. And so it, yeah. it, drugs in themselves are extremely expensive to generate. So the question is, 
is there an opportunity to be able to massively reduce the cost of doing that type of work, that R&D and the, the being able to actually, how do I safely and effectively manufacture that drug so there's the least amount of side effects? How do I yeah. do that in an efficient manner so that I can deliver that drug or therapy to the appropriate patient at the least amount of cost possible? And so what that, that's why we're so interesting is because we're able to efficient, we're, we're able to help our customers become more efficient so they can start being able to deliver some of these. The last thing you want to do is have this great drug that costs you $100,000 to take. Nobody wants that, yeah. right? And so it, it, it really Nobody just comes down to driving that efficiency. Not, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Do you think just, I mean, we don't want to get too deep in this type of line of questioning, but do you think that if the cost went down that the price for the consumer would go down? And also, corollary, do you think that knowing that these things have costs, that it should be on the individual to pay that cost? Or is this something that governments should pay or subsidize? Should an individual human being ever have to pay $100,000 for a drug personally, regardless of what it costs to make? So there, there are two questions there. I'll address them both separately. Sure. Right? The first one is um, if we were able to, let, let's just say the average is 10 to 15 years, and let's assume we drop that on 25%. So now it's sure. seven okay. to 10 years, Okay, as an example. Okay. Mm. Um, should, should the cost of the drugs drop by 25% in that scenario? I would certainly hope so. And I will tell you that being in the, this industry, I've had an opportunity to talk to a lot of these large biopharmas and it is their goal to make these affordable. There, so I, I am trusting our biopharma counterparts that as they, they become more efficient and reduce the overall time to being able to deliver these and the costs associated, that they will turn around and provide that back to the consumer. I, I believe in these companies and what they're doing. They all have the same mission as we do, really fundamentally. So I'm trusting that that will happen. The proof is in the pudding, right? I, I'm, I've got to be very clear. Proof is in the pudding there, but I'm trusting that. That's number one. Number two, now I have to answer this one by separating myself from Tetra Science. I'm not representing Tetra Science in this yes. answer. Is that fair, okay. right? Because this That's is more fair, of a, yes. a personal thought process from a, a speculation. speculation. Yeah, stricken from the record. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yes. yeah. But So it's okay for you to share, you know, as part of the podcast, but I, but again, it's more about yeah, I yes, can't understand stand representing Tetra. <laughs> this is a really Check. interesting yeah. one, right? Um, because there are, there's a fundamental thought process on is, is um, healthcare a, a right or a privilege? So it's 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 and it's a fundamental question that I really don't know the answer to, truthfully. Mm. Mm. However, I lean towards the idea of I think it's something you have to work for. Mm. And, and 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 this is this is me personally more just in life in general, is I'm not a handout kind of guy. I will gladly distribute my own funds to people when it's necessary. But I like it when there's mutual skin in the game. You know what I mean? If, if you have no skin in the game and you're just handed everything that you need, so you know your your um, healthcare is handed to you regardless of what you do in life. I don't know. That's tough. That's tough for me personally. Is that a fair point? Right? No. But that doesn't mean that government shouldn't be involved in helping funding some of these things. I'm 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 not opposed to sort of the both and versus the either or. And I think this is the problem with our society today: is the diametrically opposed thought process. It's Either this or this. Well, why can't it be both? Why can't you have some skin in the game personally, but why can't the government also help you out? I don't, hopefully I answered your question. <laughs> you did. You did. And we're not going to go too far down that line of question. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, my personal remark, I mean, I, I completely agree with your points. My personal remark on that would also be that some people can't have skin in the game because they're prevented sure, for, certain, for, certain for certain reasons. reasons. You know, you know not, not everybody is able-bodied and able of mind and uh, able to contribute in the same way that you and I are. But for those who are, I would uh, echo your sentiments. Anyway, let's push that aside. Because, yeah, no, no, it's, uh, it's still a great question, a great topic. Maybe have another podcast on, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it, you know, it's we're diving into these things because I think a lot of people, myself included, we're not quite sure what the future holds in general. And some people are excited about the future, broadly speaking. Some people are skeptical and scared of the future, broadly speaking. Healthcare is one of those areas that offers everybody a little bit of both. I mean, we've seen some documentaries. We know the pitfalls of the healthcare industry. We know the pitfalls of the pharmaceutical industry. On the other hand, we're all waiting for those miracle drugs that will cure whatever ails us, you know, for example 
example, let's just say cancer, right? We're all looking forward to the day when certain major problems are solved because we don't want our own lives cut short by something that might be preventable in the future. And so to that end, shortening the development time of things that might affect me and my health or others and their health is something that I think we're all looking forward to about the future. Now, whether we can afford that or not, a separate question, of course. Um, sure. But I think it, it, yeah, what is so interesting about this company is that it just represents concepts that are clearly very important, but again, are probably not very well understood in general. So let's talk about the idea of in silico, as you said, or the digital twin. So performing experiments to shorten the time that it takes. What kinds of experiments are we talking about and how could we shorten that? Um, so there, there, there's a there's a famous quote out there and I and I I don't remember off the top of my head which one it is or what the 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 gentleman's name but there's a quote out there from one of the large uh, top 10 biopharmas that said that basically says we already have the next drug developed but the data hasn't proven it to us yet okay meaning mm. they've probably developed the appropriate compound or protein Right, which is uh, compound would be if you're taking a pill, you have a compound in a pill, like a molecule that you're ingesting that targets something. Right, um, mm -hmm. a protein would be more along the lines of like the COVID drug, where you're taking an injection that it actually attaches itself to the to the COVID um, uh, uh, molecule. Or sorry, not molecule, cell. Right, and then ultimately kills the cell. Right, that's what a protein will do. And so they they they're like, we've already developed that thing. We just don't know what it works for yet. Does that make sense? We, so, we, they, okay. so it's an interesting thing. Why is that? Because right. they have so many compounds, molecules that they've built. They have so many proteins that they've come up with and made aware of that they've tried on one thing. But just because they tried on one thing doesn't mean it won't work on something else. Right. And so how do you physically execute all of the experiments to test that protein or to test that molecule against a target cancer as an example? when there's hundreds of thousands of them and millions of target things you can go after. How do you physically do that, right? And you, and you just can't, nobody has the funds to do that. So you have to keep trying individual, individual things. Well, what if you knew and understood, which they do, the, the DNA makeup of that protein and, and the, exact, the exact chemical compound of that molecule, and they were able to just take that and just in, on computers, run tests against every known target in the market. What if what if biopharmas shared the targets that the, the information they know about the targets they're going after publicly and you could actually run from computers tests against all these molecules, all these different protein strands, all these DNA strands and test them against them and say, interesting, we didn't know that this would work for this, but look what it does. Now we can take it and then do what they call wet lab testing, legitimately start doing real testing against that side effects, things like that. But what it's what it's really about, it's not about ev you're finding out everything, you know, electronically or completely from from machine learning models. You're using those models to trim down, right, what we really should be testing. We should be testing these. Let's take them in and then let's, act let's actually run and test them. And so that's that's what our customers are trying to get to. And what we can fundamentally help them accelerate, because we are bringing all that data in into a centralized location, we are allowing a sharing substrate between pharmaceutical companies where they could securely share some of that information. Uh, it, and it's not necessarily about, look, I'm giving you my bread and butter. You, what, what, what like Pfizer doesn't want to do with Novartis is. I'm going to give you all my molecules and all my and all my proteins that I've come up with because mm -hmm. that's their intellectual property, right? right. Um, Pfizer has the same thing. But what's not intellectual property is the makeup of the target. And some folks have put those investments in different ones. Share that information so you can test yours against them. So we're we're providing a substrate for them to share that data in a secure manner as well. Which again, when we start th talking about sharing data and and you know. Co-opetition, if you will, right? What okay. new things what co might we new. be able to do? Have people expressed interest in that? Is that something that, that you'd you be think surprised? Is going to happen? At first, I was like, "There's no way," right? You know, when we right, were creating we internally as an opportunity, there was there was like, absolutely, it's never going to happen. I mean, there was some diametrically opposed thoughts, but we we've started sharing this opportunity with a lot of these biopharmas. 
and it is actually taking root. They're starting to think about that and go, how, what, what if I could share information that in itself is not IP based and then they can share that with me and we can run it. That's so interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, there's already public facing um, uh, materials out there around certain targets that educational facilities are putting out there. So, um, but we, we need farmers to do the same. And so, and I, and I think, I think you're going to see it happening more and more as we go. Hmm, interesting. And I think that has often been sort of the the criticism or the fear of the, the general public is that because all of this is based on a, a private ecosystem, that, that that profits are more important, of course, than the progress in a global sense, right? Like my individual profits as a company are more important than whether we as humanity achieve a certain goal in 10 years. Do you think that that's a fair statement or is that something that may be shifting or do you think it's always just a little bit of both and that's just the way I, I, I think it's a little bit of both, but I think it's more perception than reality. Mm. Um, these biopharmas aren't out there to try to make billions of dollars. That's not their mission, right? Mm. But they need to recoup the cost of being mm. able to do the research necessary to bring mm. that drug to you. And, and interestingly, and this is, this is something often forgotten as well, it's not mm. just about the current drug, right? It's about the next one. So if if I'm not solvent in being able to give the market the current drug, that means I'm not solvent. I don't have funds to research the next one. It's really about continuously improving what we can do for humanity. And if the money is not coming in, meaning I'm not making money on what I've delivered, I can't do the next one, which is going to actually help me continue to fulfill my mission. So I think there's a there's just a and and I get it. The consumer thought process is, oh, they're just trying to make money off me. That's actually not the case. Right. Mm-hmm. It's really not the case. But it's so it is always going to be that tension, that little bit of both there. Mm-hmm. But but I, I would encourage your the, those that are listening and paying attention to this podcast to really step back for a moment and recognize these biopharmas aren't against you. They're for you. They really are. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a very interesting and refreshing perspective. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, your sincerity comes through very well in that. So that's that's very nice and comforting. Um, so one thing that you mentioned, which is very interesting to me. And I think this is true of data in general. Um, We know that we as a species are generating boatloads of data, more data than we can possibly fathom. Each individual, through every action, through us interacting here, through what we talk about on our phone, we're generating more data than any human can possibly conceive. And clearly, we don't have the ability as humans, no matter how many of us there are, to go through all of that data, to process all of that data, to come up with meaningful conclusions. It's just a physical impossibility at the scale that we're at, right? So the concept that this material might have already been developed, that the cure for cancer might already exist. We but might we just already don't know have it. it. We just don't know. <laughs> right? yeah. I mean, that is a pretty wild possibility to entertain, and you're saying that that is essentially the business model. That is essentially what is happening here is that we are sifting through historical data or real time live data and hopefully picking out, wait a minute, five years ago, we had it. We just didn't know. That's insane. Okay. Um, that's that's beyond the comprehension of, I think, most people, including myself. Sure. So, so then what, what, what does it take? Uh, you know, okay, digital twin, what exactly do we need to model? What needs to exist in order for us to accurately compare things yeah, that we have created? Yeah, that's a really good question. It, it's, it's for, first of all, we, we need to model the compounds really, really well. We need to mo- model the, um, uh, the proteins really well, the DNA strands associated with that really well, and then all of that for the targets as well. All of that needs to be done, and some of it's done, okay? Not all of it. So we, d- we need to make sure that we're getting all of that digital. It's, a lot of times it's still in the head of those great scientists who are just – extremely some of the smartest people on the planet truly i mean right? but no, I, I believe that digitally so that we can do that right um sure but the the next thing is is you are running physical experiments against against a lot of these things right that data needs to be captured effectively not in this hundred hundreds of thousands of data sources but in one location or a small subset of locations so that you can actually say all right we learned that when we ran these seven different experiment types, and this could be one, one of them is chromatography, which is a really around separating a solution into its series of components. It's got salt in it. It's got, you know, nitrogen in it. And it's got, does that make sense? Like, because we need to know, can we purify these things? What's in a solution? It does. Former, um, 
a former client of mine sold chromatography. Oh, <laughs> <see>. <laughs> I worked for a, a laboratory equipment supplier. They were a client of my marketing agency, just, you know, neither here nor there. But I'm familiar with the term I by a random the coincidence. So there's, yeah. a bunch, there's all these wonderful techniques that these biopharmists have come up with with their with their instrument partners to be able to figure out whether something works against the target. OK, so but all that data, the parameters of what you put into it, you know, into that experiment, um, what is the what is the appropriate solution? What's in the solution besides my active ingredients? What is what? Are, so in a pill, you think of ibuprofen as an example. Ibuprofen has what's called an API, an active pharmaceutical ingredient and a bunch of other stuff that makes it a pill. <laughs> right. So. Yeah. So what's the appropriate makeup that's going to drive the, the concentration value for a consuming patient, right? All of those things matter. So that data, right? That's all data that if that, the past experimentation results becomes available plus all of the information associated with the compounds, the proteins and the targets, right? Now we can start running those same experiments from a computer to see does it get the same result or not, right? But that all comes from machine learning of looking at past experiments that we've run with the parameter sets that those came from. So that's that's the real case is, it's not like all of a sudden it's gonna magically figure out something that we couldn't before. It's just gonna do something that would take humans years to do and it's gonna do it in minutes, right? right. That that's, that's the hope, or I'm sorry, we've seen it work already in, in a small scale. We need this to be in a massive scale to be able to truly move the needle for human life. And this might have implications for things like animal testing and human testing as well, right? Reducing some of those scenarios, because if you're able to model something in advance, like you said, you wouldn't have to do the wet experiments or whatever you called them until much later in the game, which would That's probably exactly right. You're trying to reduce, reduce the suffering right. in general, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Wow, that's that's a really really quite something. I'm I'm very much interested in this. Um, and and I I well, you brought up an interesting point where you just said that it's something that we could do. We just don't have enough time. But I wonder whether that's solely the case because I, I'm sure you've seen this data or this experiment that was done. It's uh, doing the rounds of AI the last couple years of. They had a zoomed in portion, a tiny microscopic portion of an X-ray of somebody's chest and AI and machine learning could tell whether it was a male or female subject and no doctor could identify anything visually. They weren't able to see it, but somehow machine learning had picked up on some sort of difference that we weren't able to comprehend. And I think one of the, the interesting, scary and alluring parts of machine learning and AI in general is that it can detect patterns that we can't detect. So might there be a case where it can do something that we couldn't do, even if we did have so infinite th th time? This is people? a really interesting question. The truth is, is those same doctors would have been able to do the same thing with the right information and the time to analyze it. Does, does that make okay, sense? This I got to. It, it does, but I need to hear more. Yeah. So, so, because this is the important part. We are not building, a, a, and AI is probably a misnormal because misnomer because that means artificial intelligence. It's not right. artificially intelligent. It is doing right. exactly what the program we gave it is telling it to do. Right. But the difference is, is a computer can much more rapidly sift through millions and millions and trillions of data sets to find information that we physically aren't fast enough to do. I'd have to first go get that data, analyze it, then go get the next one data, analyze it, next one to analyze it. And then I have to remember all those iterations. Humans aren't good at that. Computers are. And so again, mm. what all we're doing is we're, we're teaching the computer how to go look at all these different data sets and say, identify patterns. Because a human could identify that same pattern if we had the time, we just don't. Mm. The computer does because it's doing it automatically. It's just going through and identifying those patterns. Once it identifies it, then it can go, oh, based upon, again, this x-ray, looking at that small little, you know, microchasm subset of that x-ray, I can here, say, here. yep, that okay. correlatively tells me that this is a female specimen, right? Um, and, I, and I guarantee you, like I said, a human doctor would be able to do the same with the access to the data and the time to do the analysis, but it would take them years to figure out what the computer can figure out in minutes. And might the computer be able to say, hey, what you need to be looking at is this ratio right yes. over here. And, yes. and then the doctor can say, oh, you've identified that. Yes, yes. now, now that I'm aware. aware of that, okay, this to that is 3.4, therefore that's the difference. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> average is no, about 3.4, that average is about 3.6. Okay, so it might help us in our own identification of patterns 
by pooling that data together. Okay, well, that's right. wild. Um, so when you think of something that is so massive, especially like dealing with the data sets that you're talking about for your clients, how does a company begin to tackle a problem like that? What is the what is first the... step? How did Tetra Science pivot or wherever that part of this journey began? What needs to happen to even begin solving a problem like that? So it, it's really about merging budget in the what's happening in the lab with the budget that is being provided from the top level to be able to get to this digital twin, to get to AI and ML solutions, right? Because right now they're separate budgets. And the truth is, is the relationship of those two budgets, it's not always known by some of those top level execs in these organizations that have, that want to fund real projects. I'll give an example. So mm -hmm. we're almost always brought in by a pharmaceutical company to solve a specific challenge. I've got this data here in this instrument, and I struggle getting that data into this database. <laughs> Can you help okay. me? That? Okay, well, how do yeah. you do it today? Well, the scientist reads the data off the screen, writes it down. I was going to say, yeah, Gary types it in one. <laughs> that's, that's exactly, that's exactly right, yeah. right, right. I mean, and, and, right. And imagine the data integrity checks that has to happen. Somebody over the shoulder, did you write it down right? Did you type it in right? Right. Real things that happen. So they have budget for that. Okay. Now that budget is minuscule. Let's say it's a $30,000 a year budget okay, to do that okay. because that's how much time they'll save. They probably will save a couple of million over five years in data integrity issues, being truthful, mm. because there's a lot of costs associated with that. But I can at, imagine. Least, at least in just the work being done, there's, you know, 30, 40, whatever thousand dollars a year. So, but we have a solution that's fundamentally half a million plus into the multiple millions. Why? Because we're solving a bigger challenge. And so the truth is we want to solve that problem. But what we don't want those customers to do is solve that this data goes here in isolation because there's a thousand of that same problem within that same biopharma with with thousand different budgeted items. Does that make sense? We're saying let's pull those budgeted items together, but we must do it with a journey with the customer. We can't say day one, let's take all thousand of those projects, let's get it together. Let's start with the one, let's rapidly get number two, rapidly number three, and what happens is we start to build that centralized data store for them where they can start doing some of this interesting analysis. And and, and I think it's really important too for, for your, your um, viewers to understand that I run 20, 30, 40 different experiments on a, on a single sample. I do. That's, that's okay. what they do in the lab. And the truth is, is they're analyzing each result for each experiment individually. And then somebody is, and I'm not joking, cracking their knuckles, opening Excel, importing data into there, trying to get all those experiments to have the data together in one spot so they can run some custom calculation to say successful or failed. Okay. Wow. You understand what I'm saying? Like that, that's what I, I, I do. Yeah. Right what, but what we can do is say, well, look, you're running those 30, 40 experiments. We'll pull all that data in and we'll just give you a dashboard in real time. Is that interesting? Mm. That runs by the mm. way, even your calculation to give you that answer. I mean, that's huge for our customers. And so that it, it is, it's, it's about finding those small budgeted areas, trying to merge that budget with a broader scale so that and, and where it gets visibility into the top level execs where they recognize that as we become more digital with this data, all of a sudden this digital twin doing this analysis in silico becomes real for them. But the truth is this budget is not given to these people and this budget separate from this one. We're this is what we're doing. We're spending a lot of time asking those prospects. Look, on your behalf, we want to make you a hero. Give me access to the folks in your organization that are trying to solve AI ML use cases, because I want your project to feed that project. How interesting is that for you? And almost always they're like, wow, that, that is interesting. I don't want to forget your project. Your project matters, right? But it's part of something greater that your organization is trying to do. Let's get that marriage to happen early so that we don't end up in a scenario where, yeah, we saved you, we saved you $50,000, you spent 500. That, 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 that nobody wants that right, right. Um, so let's let's make sure we merge that together did I answer your question Ross 
Yeah, you did. And it strikes me as, is this sort of similar to like the Y2K bug in the sense that antiquated processes have just been scaled for years or even decades in these large companies and nobody's really gone in and said, hey, why are you still doing it this way? And why have you been doing it that way for the last 30 years? And maybe there's a better way. Is that basically sort of the same kind of thing that's going on? Yeah, you'll, you'll get you'll, you'll hear the joke. And, and I don't I don't want to bag on scientists in this space because they are brilliant. So all of you who are watching this scientists watching this, you're brilliant. Right. <laughs> but there is an old adage that we're, you'll see some scientists say, you're going to pry this paper notebook from my cold, dead hands. Right. There's, sure. there's a little bit of a joke there, but there's some truth to it, too. And what mm. is it? What does it really mean? It just means that change is the hardest thing for humans in general. Yeah. Right. And scientists are no different. And so helping mm. them facilitate change that drives them immediate value and drives the company long term value is what we excel at being able to do with our customers. That's clear. Well, it's fascinating. It's clear where the money is coming from, and it's also clear why people would need this at scale and why you can get truly massive customers from doing this. That's awesome. Let's uh, take a hard right turn here and ask a little bit about your own personal background. So I know you've been with this company for a couple of years. How did you get into this space? Have you always been interested in, in this aspect or more of the data side? What is your passion in all of this and what is your expertise? Tell me about your journey. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So um, I was, I mean, if, can I take it back to college years? Is that all right? That was 25 years sure ago. Yeah. Okay if I go back that far? As, as long, long as, as there's beer involved. involved. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to do whatever you need. Yeah. <laughs> you can take, take it back, back wherever, wherever you like. like. Okay. So, so well, um, it, you know, I was sort of that young guy out of high school that didn't know what he wanted to do. Truthfully, that was who I was then. Um, I went to college because I was like, I think a degree probably matters, you know? And, and so throughout college, I, I found what I was really good at was with, was communication in general. And I had a mentor, um, as a professor, at the, I went to Bethel University in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and I had a mentor who was like, you know, you should really go into the communication field. You you can take difficult concepts and wrong word, but dumb them down and make them consumable. This, you know, and that's communication. It's important that's for right. me right now. Yeah, See, I, I can vouch. See, I I'll write your like, LinkedIn like, review. Yeah. yeah, I'm 28 more years in, so that's part of the reason. Okay, I'd be all right, good. <laughs> very good. Yeah. Um, so, so I went in the communication field and I was going to be in television broadcasting. Now, now go back 25 years ago. People trusted the media. Mm-hmm. Today, it's not, it's not as prevalent. Is that fair? Right? It's just not as prevalent. That's there. fair. But I, I, had a, I had an issue 25 years ago as I was working with some of these, um, some of these television stations during, during my tenure in college. And I was like, this is the most biased thing I've ever seen I could not believe how biased the media was. And I was like, this must be just, I must be in a microcosm that's not real. And folks that, and then I started talking to folks in the industry, they're like, no, this is common, right? And, and so I stepped back for a moment and asked, man, do I want to be part of this, right? Mm. Do I really want to be part of an industry that is, that is wrong word, but not lying is the wrong word, but hiding who they really are from the public, right? They're making the public uh-huh. think that we're completely unbiased and we're just, we're telling you the news as it is and we're not putting any biased spin on it at all. It's just, this is what, just this is just the core, core raw facts. And they were legitimately cutting facts that weren't within the agenda of that specific station politically, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I could not believe that was happening. When I tell people 25 years ago, they're like, you're crazy, they're great. Look how good these guys are. Look at how, look at how trusting they are in TV, right? Um, now everybody looks and goes, oh, I totally understand what you're saying. So I ended right. up somehow getting into the IT industry programming. So I, how I kind of cut my teeth. And then then I became an architect, a technical architect. And then I was hired by Oracle because of the, by, by the way, why did Oracle hire me? Because they, they said, what you do well is you were able, we were trying to sell to your company. The company I was working for at the time was Fastenal. They're an industrial supplier. And they, and they said, okay, okay. we came in to sell software to your company and you were in the room representing Fastenal. And you are basically the one translating what we're trying to say to your folks at Fastenal. Mm-hmm. We need that. Mm-hmm. And so that's how I kind of switched over to the dark side, if you will, into the sales world. Um, and I did that with Oracle for six years. And then I left for MuleSoft because they had a fundamental better product. Like I, I, I know people always claim this, but it matters to me is integrity and what you're selling is important, right? It's Same. not just not just because you can sell a widget doesn't mean that widget really drives any value to anybody. And so it was big for me. I left Oracle because MuleSoft fundamentally had a better integration product than I was selling at the time. And I was there for six years. And then I got to the point where I'm starting to get late in my career. So this is driving me towards where I am today, where, you know, I, I've got 
I've got the bandwidth, I've got the heart, and I've got the energy to maybe do this startup thing one more time. But but it's got to be different than before. It can't just be about the dollar. Does that make sense? It's got to be something else. And and so as I was looking around, and I and I had a, a trusted friend of mine who worked for Tetra Science that said you got to come over here and told me why. And so I had some conversations. And like the fundamental conversation that struck me the most was was I was communicating with one of the individuals at Tetra Science as I was interviewing, and I said why here, right? Why this? Why this for you? I mean, you could do anything you want because you're brilliant, why this, right? And the answer was, struck me, said, if I was able to do something to work for a startup and help fundamentally grow something financially that's good for me and my family, while at the same time helping humanity, why wouldn't I wanna choose that? And that's that stuck, that stuck with me and really struck me at, at, at my core. And so I stepped back and said, Man, he's absolutely right. Why wouldn't I want to do that? If I can create financial security and freedom for myself while helping humanity, that's much better than just doing it for the for the bottom dollar. And so that that's that's what brought me over here. Now, something else personally, which which you don't know because so you're not going to ask, so I'm going to seed it for you. Is I was a year into the company, <laughs> and um, hopefully you can see this on camera. But do you see this large uh, scar right here? By the way, they I, did a I really nice well. job hiding it into my fold. But this is a scar. A year into the okay. company, I was diagnosed with neck and throat cancer. Had obviously had no idea, um, and it was the it was one of those types of cancer. It's called squamous cell carcinoma. That 40, 50 years ago was a death sentence, and now it's the appropriate surgery and radiation, and we can get rid of it. And so now I'm a I'm a um, um, a year removed from that, free and clear. About a month ago, I was diagnosed, um, declared as free and clear. And, awesome. and so, so I have a personal belief in what we're doing because I'm, I'm one of the people that actually received value out of what these pharmaceutical companies has been, have been doing in the last 40 or 50 years. And if I can help them accelerate that, why wouldn't I want to do it? Wow. That's a beautiful sentiment. And that what you said a few sentences back is literally the overarching premise of this entire show basically <laughs> can you make money while well, doing good is perhaps the sub tagline of this show and the underlying theme that connects you to so many other brilliant people that i've spoken with um and i kind of knew that going into it so i'm very very pleased to hear you wrap that up with such a neat little bow at the end of our conversation because that about <laughs> well, that, that sums it up, it up. I mean, that's the watching. propaganda you didn't plan for this this just no. come naturally that's, that's the, the propaganda, propaganda machine <laughs> in action. That's the like, are you getting the message yet? Um, thing uh, flashing in people's screens. That's beautiful. And and I wholeheartedly agree. And it's very refreshing again to hear you talk about industries that perhaps people don't very, very well understand and also to have a positive spin on that. Again, just being a different voice in people's ear on some of these topics and a different perspective, which I think is always a valuable thing, especially in stuff that we don't understand in a scary world that feels more complex and weird by the day. Having somebody say that I believe wholeheartedly in this has, is a powerful statement. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. And I'm, I'm very happy to hear that you're on the other side of, of your own cancer battle. That's a, that's awesome. Thanks for sharing oh, that. Absolutely. No problem. Um, so that's a fascinating story. Uh, let's see. Is there any bits of advice that you would have um have, has your life changed, I guess, to wrap things up since you have been more on this mission verse before? Do you feel differently about your work day to day? And do you have any advice for somebody who might be showing up and grinding it out every day, but not quite sure that their work is contributing to humanity? It's a good question. Um, I would say yes. My perspective has changed drastically. Uh, my, my worldview has changed drastically from being in this industry. I was I was a skeptic about the pharmaceutical inter, industry before coming here, and and it, it's interesting. You get deep and, become, and get a chance to to see and learn and understand what these companies are doing and and why things cost the way they do. Uh, just kind of stepped me back a little bit and said, okay, my worldview around this industry is incorrect, right? Th these they are these are some really highly ethical companies that just happen to be in a really really tough position. Right. They've got to be solvent to do the next thing. And so so I think that was a big change for me was really understanding that they're not just trying to make a bottom dollar on me. They, they, they yeah, of course, everybody has to pay their bills. Right. That's that's life. We all do that. Right. But they're doing it 
um, with the intent of truly improving and extending human life. And, and seeing that and getting that getting to be firsthand and get to talk to some of these scientists in the lab and know that this is really what they're trying to accomplish. It's it's really changed my my worldview on this industry as a whole. And I hope, you know, maybe through this conversation, there's some folks out there listening that get the opportunity to see and learn and understand that, too. And when it's all said and done, you want to you want to see the, the cost of this continue to drop. Get involved. Get involved. There's lots of opportunities in this industry to help improve what they're doing. They want to improve it because they want to be able to try, um, drive new and better therapies. So, yeah, I, I would say that's the biggest change for me. That makes sense. Well, I can definitely confirm that you're an excellent communicator and speaker. You have handled yourself extraordinarily well during this interview, so kudos on that. It strikes me that you and I are somewhat similar in that regard and that I, I own a marketing agency, a digital marketing agency, and... I think my greatest skill in life is also distilling the complex and making it palatable. And that's what I certainly do in my company is, you know, taking a whole big pool of complex ideas and spitting it out into something that's beautiful and digestible. And whether that's a website or any of the digital assets that companies need to tell their story. So I think you and I have a lot of common ground on that uh, particular point. And I very much appreciate you guiding me through from the beginning and the basics of all of this and uh, and sharing your perspective. It's it's very valuable. I think you have a very cool career arc. I'm very glad that you have done that. Um, and I'm glad that you found that for yourself, especially if that change came about in the last couple years this far into your career. How inspiring is that for anybody, no matter what stage they're at in their career, to say, hey, you that could be out there for you. Yeah, if absolutely. you just make a few few good decisions. I guess awesome. my only regret is why didn't I do this 20 years ago? Well, sure. <laughs> the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. now. That's the ancient Chinese proverb. Right. So for many of us, now is all we've got, myself included. And yep. I think, you know, you said you were you hadn't figured it out by the time we were in high school. I think there are many 30, 40, 50 year olds who are holding their hand up and saying, I still don't have it figured out. <laughs> so uh, I think, you're, you know, you're lucky that you figured it out when you did. I would argue that many people never figure that out. Many people, unfortunately, uh, slip away before they're ever able to come to that. So the fact that you did it all is awesome. Um, so Tetra Science, the website, where can people find and support you? If you want to share your LinkedIn or anything, this is your chance to, to promote whatever you'd like to promote to close us out. Yeah, I, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and promote the company more than myself. Uh, yep. so www.tetrascience.com. That's T E T R A science.com. Um, if you, if you step back a little bit and you look at what Tetra means, it means four. So we are a company that is for science, right? Not number four, but F-O-R. So it's, it's just an interesting, um, you know, sort of play on words there, if you will. So tetrascience.com, come on out, have a look, see what we're doing and uh, get involved if you can. We're always hiring. We're looking for great, strong people who want to make a difference in this world. So if you're one of those, reach on out and we'd love to have a conversation. Sounds great, Mike. And hopefully you won't be yelling for too much out on the links as you finally <laughs> break <laughs> par. Thanks to go. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're just right down the middle. The only time I want to yell for is when it's 380 yards away. That's, that's right. right. Hopefully for 18 holes in a row, you don't yell for even once. And then you finally achieve your goal. I'm, I hope that for you. Um, thanks again. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. And with that, uh, the official podcast is over. Oh.